Welcome to episode four of Your Take. I'm your host, James Ewan. Your take, your path, your perspective. I'm joined in conversation today by a gifted American singer-songwriter. His music career began in the 1970s and incorporates folk, rock and country. He's a storyteller, toured his music across the globe, and his songs have been covered by a number of artists from Johnny Cash, Katie Lang, Joe Ely, and Nancy Griffiths. He's recorded many albums. He's a painter and has also written a number of books. Today, I'm joined by Tom Russell, who gives us an insight into his life, his music, his, music, his songs, the memories, and what the future might hold. Nice to be joined by you today. Good morning. Good morning, James, and uh, I'm glad to be here. Are you all right? I'm very well, to be honest. Yeah, yourself? <laughs> I, picked it. I picked that up on my many tours of the UK. You all right? Yeah, I'm all right. I'm literally all right. <laughs> yeah, all right, it's great. Man. We're in the, uh, my wife and I are in the Immental Valley of Switzerland. We have a small place overlooking a ancient farm country, and we also spend part time in Texas, outside of Austin, Texas, where we hope to record our next record in the fall. Yeah. What are the interesting things about doing the research on you and the, the preparation is you've lived such a, an interesting life, which I'm going to come on to and talk about in detail in our uh, conversation and interview. But I wanted to start off with kind of the current time, or should I say, going back two years ago to 2019, uh, you received critical acclaim for your last album called October in the Rail Railroad Earth. Can you just tell us about the album, the theme, the songs? And I also wanted to mention a, a favorite guitarist of mine and make the kind of viewers aware of him if they've not come across him, Bill Kirchin as well, working with him. Wonderful. Uh, let me start where you left off, Bill Kirchin. Uh, I've known him. I've been a fan since Commander Cody uh, was playing in 1970. They were crossing the border up in Canada when I was just getting started in Vancouver. And boy, the Telecaster sound. And uh, as a kid that grew up on Bakersfield music, the twang, the Buck Owens and Don Rich and, and this, this type of twang, Bill is one of the last uh, heroes of the Telecaster and now he, he lives in, he's originally from near DC somewhere, but uh, uh, he was a friend of one of my guitar players, Andrew Harden. Bill lives in Austin now, and occasionally I'll go and jam with him and do a Johnny Cash song. And, and he's all over this record, uh, October in the Railroad Earth, uh, which came out uh, on our label, Frontera, and also on Proper for the rest of the world, Proper UK. But yeah, we love Bill. My, my wife, I took my wife to see uh, an afternoon show with Bill about four years ago at uh, Continental Club in Austin, and she had never heard it. Although my wife, who was younger than me, uh, uh, was close friends with Doug Song when she was a kid, and Augie Myers, kind of her honorary godmother. So she didn't put up with any BS. Bill was tuning up. She goes, well, I hope he plays pretty soon. The minute he started playing, she, Bill Kirshen had the biggest fan in the world, <laughs> my wife, Nadine, and they become friends and because uh, he has the sound. So anyway, October in the Railroad Earth, I call it the sound of the record. I call it uh, uh, Buck Owens meets Johnny Cash and Jack Kerouac in Bakersfield, uh, sonically. Sure. Uh, gut level. And uh, a few of the songs, October and the Railroad Earth, the title song, is based uh, around a prose poem Jack Kerouac wrote when he was a brakeman on the uh, Southern Pacific Railway in California. Neil Cassidy, his hero, got him a job, Kerouac, as a brakeman for a while. I don't know how long it lasted. And he lived in a Skid Row hotel and he went to work every day and uh, he got this great prose poem out of it, October in the Railroad Earth. And he recorded it later with jazz pianist Steve 
Allen on the piano, you know, and uh, I was always inspired by that. So I wrote a song about Jack living in that hotel and going to work. I don't know how good a brakeman he was or a manual labor guy, but it kind of themed the record. The next song, Small Engine Repair, I won't go through all of them, just a couple, but Small Engine Repair is about the guy who uh, fixed my lawnmowers and stuff when we lived in El Paso. And we've since moved to Texas, but he was a real interesting guy and he fixed people's yard stuff. And I wrote the song about him and he lived near the Rio Grande and he opened the water that brought the Rio Grande onto the crops. And I had that job for a while too. Uh, the, uh, they called it the Alcalde, the mayor of the water ditch. You, you gave, I, I was only two farms around me, but you gave them a certain amount of water once every two weeks. I had some pecan trees. I was masquerading as a farmer, you know, writing songs about all this. So, but the funny thing is, Small Engine Repair was picked up by an Irish film director mm. six or seven years ago. I can't recall his name. People can find it online. If you go on YouTube and put in Small Engine Repair, there's this famous actor singing a little bit of my song in the movie. He, he's gone on to be famous in uh, a couple of sitcoms that are on TV now. He's a Scottish actor. I'm, I'm blanking on his name, but you can find it. And uh, so the song got into an Irish movie, which was, which was pretty cool. The next song, uh, I'll, I'll do one more here, uh, because it relates to you. Okay. You're in Bristol, right? That's right, yeah, the city of Bristol. Isidore Gonzalez is song number three. It's a Tex-Mex corrido. Mm. Corrido, like Gallo del Cielo, means a long story song, a, a running running corrido story and the tex maniacs from san antonio play with me on it that's max baca and josh josh baca max baca plays the uh, uh the conjunto type uh, guitar and uh his uh, nephew plays the tex-mex accordion the accordion music that came over from europe 80 100 years ago and landed in texas the mexicans got the accordions a bajo sesto is what uh, Max Baca plays. It's like a 12 string, 16 string guitar. Boom, boom, boom. And it gives me the sound. But Isidore Gonzalez, very briefly, rode with Buffalo Bill over 100 years ago, must have been the 1880s, when he took the troop to England and all over the world, really. But he had some Indians. Uh, Sitting Bull was with the troop for a while, Annie Oakley and buffalo and horses and it was a huge thing a lot of people tell me they remember their grandparents great grandparents seeing the buffalo bill show well isidore gonzalez true story uh was a mexican bronc rider and in one of the shows a horse fell on him and he died in uh, bristol and he's buried in an unmarked grave probably right outside your window <laughs> So I want you to write his name on there and go put it on the grave. But a fan of mine has located the grave in one of your cemeteries. And one oh, of these right. days, we're going to, one of these days, we're going to see that that's rectified and go sing him the song. And uh, the last, so I mentioned Bristol in the song and then, then he flies, his soul flies back to Monterey, Mexico uh, after that. The only other song I would mention would be Highway 46 which is a highway that runs from the West Coast of California to Bakersfield. And I was driving on that highway the day Merle Haggard died, who I knew. Dave Alvin and I did a tribute to Merle uh, called Tillary Dust. And so there's a bit of Bakersfield, a real Bakersfield uh, saga. That's the highway James Dean ended up uh, head, you know, head, head on collision and died on that highway. So that's enough about October, I think. Incredibly, in the first five minutes of the, the interview, you've already kind of set us up about these songs have personal stories and they're based on factual people's lives, things that happened. Interestingly, you made the comparison, you mentioned feature film, cinema. Obviously, when a, 
a filmmaker or a scriptwriter comes up with a narrative for a film, they come up, they flesh out the story, they they write a script. When you specifically write a, an album like the one you've mentioned, and you've got like a theme running through it, do you have like a set amount of songs that you come up with in relation to that theme, or do or do you just work on songs for a couple of years and think, oh, I'll put that one on the album, I'll leave that for another one? How does it kind of work for you that process? I could pull this huge stack of lyrics over here I, I'm working on for the next record. Certainly some of the songs fit a theme. The next, I, I won't give away the title I'm working on, but the next album is a real blue collar look at blue collar jobs and trying to get the real truth from people I've talked to in gas stations and in bars. To me, that's, and in pubs, if, if it was, if I was living in England, where people not the media, but where people actually give part of their soul. So certainly four or five or six of the uh, songs on the next album will fit the theme, but I don't want to get too thematic. I've done three thematic records, big thematic records. Uh, the Rose of Ross Cray, which was a double record with 50 tracks and it had Johnny Cash on it and God, it led Belly and even Walt Whitman trying to expand the notion of Americana, which they blame Dave Alvin and I for with that Tulare dust. But what is Americana? Does it involve Canadian music, Mexican music? So I tried to expand on this with an out, double outlaw record on the West. I did a record called Hot Walker, which was mm -hmm. mostly spoken word. Bukowski, Lenny Bruce, Kerouac are on there. And the record that probably got the most recognition, The Man from God Knows Where, that was recorded in Norway, but is about my Norwegian and Irish ancestry, using some of the diary stuff from their journals about coming to America and uh, farming in Iowa and stuff. So I have done totally thematic records that have done pretty well. This one, it's going to be some blue collar songs, the next one, but I think you always have to have a big song ending the record. Like I have a song that's been released slowly out and have been on some, some uh, festivals called Into the Wild. And it's a big love song. You know, it's, it's like uh, something maybe Joe Cocker and Jennifer Warnes could sing. So I think you have to balance. You know, I was, most songs, if you go back all the way to the twenties are either about love and breaking up and country music. And, I've been a little more thematic than that. But I always like to have a, a big ballad on there and I'm planning on doing a duet uh, with a, a couple of uh, singers I know, lady singers that I know. Uh, last record had Eliza Gilkes on it. So you try for a balance to make a listenable record that pleases you. Do you find it sometimes frustrating that we as kind of listeners of music, music lovers and the media, the critics, the music press, we always tend to label people. So if you're a specific performer, we always say like they perform country or they're a blues artist or whatever. Yeah. Do you find that yeah. frustrating sometimes that people might say Tom Russell, he's country roots, Americana. Yeah. Do, you want, do you find that sometimes that labeling a little bit? I think so. I know why they have to do it because they need to get a pay. They need a paycheck and Every, you know, I'm, I'm a, there's not a lot of great music journalism in America these days. I think there's some good music journalism in the UK. I'm not trying to kiss up, but Mojo and uh, Uncut have some good writers. I know Michael Simmons is a friend of mine that writes for, I think he writes for Mojo. Uh, Sylvie Simmons is good. Uh, but they, some, you know, you notice, you turn every page, there's the jazz page, there's the country yeah. page there's the americana page now i go back to growing up with graham parsons and steve young and the eagles and when it was called country rock because they mixed both and then it went through all these no depression progressive country alt country americana so i understand the labels work and also for radio people and i used to do quite a few shows on the bbc and a couple of shows years ago, a few years ago, went from focusing on Americana folk singers, which they considered me too, 
all of a sudden somebody told them to do Nashville country. So people like me were kind of pushed out because they thought, well, this will, you know, so they're always thinking of labels. It doesn't bother me that much. It didn't bother Bob Dylan. Mm. He broke through every label they put on his head. Nice answer. I like that. We're going to um, move on in a minute and talk about your past and your upbringing and your roots and all kinds of stuff. But before you, you're involved in so many creative things. It's, it's so interesting. And obviously in the background, we can see your artwork, all this, all these paintings. Can you just tell us a little bit about how you got into painting and also mm -hmm. about writing you've published um okay essays. Yeah. Well, let's start with the paintings because I, I could just say there's a self-portrait of me up on the top piano lucinda williams next to me then there's maybe not be able to see it but rambling jack and woody guthrie in washington square bob dylan two of bob dylan whose 80th birthday comes may 24th Leonard Cohen, Chelsea Hotel, and I met Leonard once in uh, Toronto. I wrote that on the back. Dylan down here, Dylan, rough and rowdy ways. I was living, let's start with the painting, and I'll go back to the novel. Uh, I was living in El Paso years ago, must have been 2001, 2002, I can't remember, but it was a big place, 1930s adobe, historic adobe, and I was the water dish guy and touring all over the world. But I had a big space in the back that was a garage that somebody had converted into a painting studio before they left. And I, I messed around with painting uh, and carving when I was in Nigeria. Uh, I talk about a lot of this there's two books of my art out i talk a lot about this in the current artwork the ballad of western expressionism which they can find on frontera records but uh, um i went out to that studio one day i bought a few big canvases and uh, with no uh with no art technique at all i never have had a model or i never learned how to do uh paint the human anatomy very well. And uh, I think like Dylan too, when he started painting, but I had, I had the, uh, I guess the passion to try some, I like color. Uh, I like uh, expressionism. I liked Wilhelm de Kooning and probably my biggest influence because I, I do paint a lot of Native Americans. I feel in a way a little bit Native American. Uh, is a is a painter he's gone now named Fritz Shoulder, who had a huge studio in uh, Santa Fe and ended up in Scottsdale. But he painted he took it to another place. Western art, smeared faces, kind of like Francis Bacon, the Irish English painter. But uh, I was inspired by these guys, so I just went out there and started throwing the paint. And so then somebody, uh, El Paso Museum of Art bought one of my trip ticks, which is three paintings together about the Juarez drug war. It's called a uh, Juarez Guernica based on Picasso's Guernica, huge painting about uh, a bombing in Spain uh, during the revolution there. And uh, people started, uh, by my paintings a yard dog studio in austin started picking up on my painting so i was inspired you can't write songs all day you know you can't write all day you can't be all called of the water ditch all day so it was a release and uh when i met my lovely wife nadine she was amazed that i went out there every day and worked a couple hours because it was an outlet you know, it's either that and then you could come in and have happy hours. So it's been since 2003 and it's progressed. And uh, there's an art site now, TomRussellArt.com, where the five or seven galleries around the world, including ours, has all of my current art up and how to get it, you know. And we do some on canvas roll. So instead of having to ship it out of here in huge cartons, we can roll it up and then you can frame it yourself but so that was that and uh, as far as the novel writing I've always sort of been 
thinking about being a novelist. This is the one that just came out, which is called Against the Blood. Again, we put it out on Frontera before I sent it off to, uh, I sent it to somebody at Netflix and another uh, a UK agency or anything, but I wanted my fans to have a, be able to have a signed first edition, but uh, it's basically about uh, a uh, Native American actor, screenwriter, and a young cowboy folk singer driving across the West in 1953, the year Hank Williams died. And they're discussing the last days of the Western movie. That's basically it. And uh, they know a lot. Now, my brother, who's older than me, uh, was a horse wrangler in the film world. He still works in California. But he told me a lot about that there were 100,000 horses in the L.A. basin in the 1950s, mostly having to do with the film business, the Western film business. But Back in the, this is funny, and I'll do a quick anecdote. Back in the 70s, where uh, let me take a cup of tea. When I started playing music after Nigeria up in uh, Vancouver in the honky tonks, eight hours a night, I began to write songs, some of them not very good, some of them about Indians because the bars had a lot of Native Americans in there, including Chief Dan George, who played in Little Big Man. He'd come in and request the Ballad of Ira Hayes by uh, Peter Lafarge that Johnny Cash did. But uh, I began to write songs, and we'll get to that uh, big song you asked about in a minute, uh, but uh, the Corrido. But uh, I also wrote a novel about working in a honky-tonk, and it was called Honky Tonk Stardust Cowboy, based on, a, that's a Jonathan Edwards song. I said, okay, I'm gonna send it off to a publisher because I think it's pretty good. Who's the biggest publisher in America? William Morris Agency. Bang, I sent it off to William Morris. I get a letter back from a guy named Mel Berger who I think is still there heading it. He said, this is good. We'll shop it around. Uh, well, nothing ever happened with that novel. He didn't, nobody picked up on it. But I thought, number one, I thought, hell, I'm a novelist, that's easy. Then I wrote two songs about Native Americans in 73, 74. One was called, Here's Your Indian Mr. White Man. And it was a protest kind of song. And it won the first and last Woody Guthrie Memorial Songwriting Award. I got a big, really nice troubadour statue in our little bar in Texas made by Woody Guthrie's niece, beautiful. And the guy, uh, who was going to bring me the award from Seattle or New York or somewhere was uh, the guy who wrote the words to I Dreamed I Saw Joe Hill Last Night. Again, uh, oh God, I'm blanking on his name, but he calls me from Seattle to Vancouver about 50 miles away. He says, by the way, what tribe are you from? I said, I'm, I'm not from any tribe. I feel close to Native Americans, but I never said I was from a tribe. He goes, well, I think I'll just mail you the statue. In other words, they wanted me to be an Indian, you know, and that was my first kind of immersion into the business, even if it was right, left, in between. Next year, I won the, the uh, professional country category of the, uh, the, the first American song festival. They flew you out to Saratoga Springs, New York, and it was an ABC TV show and somebody performed your song. It was performed by the Hager brothers who used to be on Buck Owens, may they rest in peace. The twins, they were twins and they butchered the song. But unbeknownst to them and their hopes, the song won anyway. So here I was given this plaque and pretty good money and uh, it was put on a record. And I thought, man, this is going to be easy. I wrote two songs, got two big awards, and I wrote a novel, and it's with the William Morris Agency. Well, here's something for all you writers out there. Fast forward about six years when I'm driving a taxi in New York, 12 hours at night, you know, six at night to six in the morning. All that kind of slowly went away, uh, which we can talk a little bit about, but I had to pay my dues like everybody else. I guess that's the uh, that's the uh, summation of that. Can we 
turn the clock back to um, going back to the 1940s into Los Angeles. And I wanted to ask you about your childhood growing up in LA, what your relationship was like with your parents or any siblings you may have had, and just about what life was like back in, was it 1947 when you were born? Somewhat, I won't tell you the exact. I think it was 53. <laughs> That's the thing about Wiki now. People, they think they're going to find. I, I would like to say, well, I was born on a Blackfoot Indian reservation in 59. You know, So you get people away from judging you by your age. But sure. uh, it was the late 40s. And uh, I don't recall much. We lived in Englewood. And uh, uh, it was changing. My father went through a lot of jobs and became a developer. Inglewood Park Cemetery uh, it was right up the street where a lot of famous actors and musicians and even Chet Baker are buried. Uh, my father came from Iowa horse people. He moved out west, met my mother, and he got back into horses once he started making some money. Not so much as a horseman, but he, Hollywood Park Racetrack was a mile or two away. They tore it down a few years ago, but thoroughbred racetrack and he hung out there and I have a song about this coming on the next record and played poker every day behind the scenes with Hopalong Cast. The actor's name is William Boyd and when he had the money he would buy a racehorse. There was there were certain races you could buy a, a cheaper racehorse because the owner was trying to get rid of it and then you could try, try to develop the horse yourself. So he got into that and my brother my older brother, who's the Wrangler cowboy of the, of the crew, hung out at the track and rode ponies. He wasn't a jockey. He's a big guy. And he immediately got into the horse scene. He got into rodeo and this and that. He built a bucking barrel in our backyard, and uh, which became later famous in the movie Urban Cowboy when the bars had mechanical bucking barrels and people would ride them. But my, my brother got into it uh, completely. Uh, after high school and then uh, we were raised as Catholics and my sisters one of my sisters the younger sister likes horses my older sister is a writer painter now working on her stuff but there was a lot of music to be concise there in the record cabinet from the Kingston Trio to Broadway shows to uh, oh my god my uncle my mom's brother George Malloy who you can see on YouTube playing behind jazz harmonica player Larry Adler was a uh, classical pianist who went on the road all over the world playing the people that Porky and Bess uh, with Todd Duncan and Camilla Williams. He played the, the Star Spangled Banner at the March on Washington in 1963. Dylan was up next or something. So, and he ended up, my uncle ended up a bachelor in New York City passed away a few years ago, but uh, he turned me on to a lot of music. My brother, Pat, had a lot of records, turned me on to a lot of music. Marty Robbins, you know, uh, gunfighter ballads and trail songs was a huge influence on lots of songwriters, including our friend Bernie Toppin, Elton John's mm. lyricist. Yeah. He, he has told me, he has told me many times, uh, the effect that record had on him. That's that's why he would write some of those country-based songs with Elton. So, and the Kingston Trio with Tom Dooley, you know, and and my brother had Hank Williams '78s. And meanwhile, the freeway system was coming into L.A. and moving people out to the suburbs. So that was just some of the color that was happening until I went off to uh, college. I was going to talk about your education years and California, the university in Santa Barbara. Interestingly, you're not studying music there, but you did a, a master's degree in sociology of law and criminology. What made you decide to kind of follow that path uh, in your early years? I didn't. I wanted to be a songwriter. I did have a guitar. I bought a I have a song about that too, a 1946 Martin D-18 in a pawn shop in San Luis Obispo, California. God, it must have been in the late 60s because I took it to uh, Nigeria. I didn't really have the guts to 
to pursue music yet professionally. I wasn't comfortable on stage. I tried it. I didn't have the stage chops that I'm still learning, you know, how to control the audience, the occasional sing-along. I even do a kind of simulated opening act now where I go out and do a, a medley and I say, I'm not Tom Russell, but it warms the audience up. Then I can be t Tom Russell. You know, I, I learned all these things. I've been taking guitar lessons lately online from Max De Bernardi to get my solo chops up at a higher level. And I sure. think that they think they are. It's a good time to do that. But uh, I didn't have the, uh, it wasn't the time. So I, I actually flunked out of Santa Barbara the first year, went to a community college in San Luis Obispo, where I probably bought the guitar and got back into Santa Barbara because I discovered sociology. It interested me. It was stories about people mostly that I liked. So I went back to Santa Barbara, long story short, and met a famous professor who's passed on now, William Chambliss, who taught the sociology of law and criminology. And he was a real interesting guy. He did a, a book on uh, a safe cracker called Box Man and some other things. And he started having me do footnotes in his book and I would coyly put my own name in the footnotes for no reason that he would laugh at that but he also was a huge Leonard Cohen fan and some nights we would sit around with he had a guitar I had a guitar and we would play Leonard Cohen songs he lived near where I lived he had a family and then uh, we bought a couple of old horses from my brother the old nag horses and we rode along the beach so we had a lot in common and uh he gets a gig working in Nigeria, a grant for a year. And a lot of turmoil happening in 69 around the campus riots. He said, uh, you wanna go over there and be my teaching assistant? And I go, where's Nigeria? I had no clue what was going on, that the Biafran war was going on, just ending. I had no clue what, what I was gonna do over there, but I went and it was an eye-opening experience. On the way back, we ended up in Morocco and Spain, but I think I played more guitar than I taught school. And uh, I read a lot of novels, Graham Greene, one of my favorites we can talk about. But uh, so it was a year of transition. And uh, uh, by the time I got back, uh, I told him, you know, uh, we ended up in Canada. I ended up in Canada because uh, I wanted to, I don't know. Uh, we had met somebody in Nigeria who said, come up, visit. And we stayed. I stayed there for uh, three or four years and started playing the honky tonks. I mean, I had, I got a lot of odd blue collar jobs, uh, chipping ice out of railroad switches and uh, then being a census taker for a couple of weeks. And I went into these Skid Row hotels because nobody else wanted to do it. Heard these guys stories, these old sailors and stuff and hookers and I walked into a honky tonk on Skid Row and saw a band play in the afternoon I go I would love to do that bang I put a band together it took a couple months and that's how I started with regard to the music it seemed that playing music at a circus in Puerto Rico was kind of one of your early first encounters uh, with music performance did that kind of experience make you want to pursue a career that early yeah. or were there other elements and other factors as well i was a little burnt out at that time see that wasn't in the 70s that was 82 probably and i wrote a song called the road to buy a moan about that experience what had happened was this when, when hardin and russell sort of hit the wall after two records in the 70s and we lost a contract with Vanguard that didn't come through and uh, we were both, we'd had enough. I attended bar in San Francisco where I met Robin Williams. That's a whole other story, comedy bar. Next move was to New York and I had to start over and I, I started driving taxi because the guy that owned a, a cab company, uh, was a kind of a amateur country singer. He goes, I'll give you a job. And it was a job, but it was six at night till six in the morning. And I was getting burned out on that when an old friend named Mark from San Francisco uh, 
that I met offered me a job in his father's carnival in Puerto Rico as a urban cowboy singer. This was when Urban Cowboy came out with John Travolta and the bucking bulls in bars and uh, line dance music was big for a couple of years and you had to have a fiddle player. So he offered me a gig there for two months and uh, I went to the carnival and boy, it was rough storms. And uh, I had a French Canadian disco band backing me up and the audience wasn't really going for Gallo del Cielo or anything. So. I survived until the rains came and the carnival closed down. And uh, I went back to uh, New York and really didn't know how to start again at the bottom. And one night, I don't know if you were going to ask me about this, but one night in a cab, I got a call to pick up a guy near, our, near the house who was working a theater gig solo. And it was Robert Hunter. The lyricist for the Grateful Dead wrote some of their big songs. And I knew Robert Hunter. So I was, wow. I picked up Robert Hunter. He had a glass of Jack Daniels and a guitar, and he got in the back off to his hotel, which was about 10 miles away. And I stupidly, I kind of said, I'm a songwriter too. You know, like if I was in the back and Robert Hunter, I'd say, yeah, sure, kid. But uh, he said, sing me one of your songs. And I sang, well, a few years ago, I said, I sang this long song, Gallo del Cielo, I wrote. He said, um, sing it for me. And I started the first verse. Um, and he stopped me and said, maybe you could do this. He goes, I'm sorry, sing the whole song. I got through the seven minute song and uh, he said, stop the cab. He goes, you wrote that? And I go, yeah, he goes, that's incredible. You have a tape of it. I go, yeah, back at the house, eight miles away. He goes, I'll pay the cab fare. Let's go get me a cassette of the tape. I go, wow, this is pretty far out. And I went back, found the cassette, gave it to me. He goes, I'm going to play this for the Grateful Dead and also for the new writers of the Purple Sage, who were pretty big at the time, and uh, see if they'll cut it. And I go, wow, thanks. And then back to his hotel for an incredible trip and uh, I, I went home told everybody and they go wow but i didn't expect anything to happen because of everything i've been through and he called up a week later and said well the new writers aren't cutting right now and the dead aren't but i'll tell you what i'm coming to new york in a couple weeks to play the bitter end i want you to open for me now this is a guy who'd never even heard me on stage he loved the song but uh, no, actually, before that, he had me up on stage a couple of days before he called me out of the audience to sing Gallo del Cielo to an audience of deadheads at the bitter end. And he handed me the guitar and split. And I thought, and I had to play really for three or four months. And these deadheads were just looking at me and I got through Gallo del Cielo and they gave me the standing ovation and Robert yelled out, do another one. That got me back physically into the music business. Sure. Then, then he came to the Lone Star Cafe a few weeks later and hired me to open for him. And that's when I got Andrew Harden out of the newspaper uh, to work with me. And that's how that started. And since then, I kind of haven't looked back. He was um, he worked with you for many years, Andrew Hardin, as a, a lead guitarist. How important is he for your musical career? And of course, you also formed the Tom Russell Band uh, with him as well. Has he been kind of like a, a very key instrumental figure working alongside you over the years? Yeah, Andrew Hardin is very special. He lives in Texas now and has, still has a career going, and great guitar player. He, he started as a drummer in Hawaii with a man named Jim Simitekel, I guess, in a band, and he ended up in D.C. He knew Bill Kirchin, played with Kirchin, and he ended up in New York. He actually was driving taxi, too. So he was one of the guys that said, yeah, you got to get going. you got great songs. I said, you're a great guitar player. He was very instrumental. And then uh, we were playing a bar and an agent from Norway heard us and said, Olaf Thun, who owns a lot of bars in Norway, wants bands 
from all over the world to come and play two months, six nights a week in his bars and discos and this and that. And can you put a band together? And that's how we put the Tom Russell band together. Billy Troiani, uh, Richie Crane, Fats Kaplan, who to this day is a great instrumentalist, plays lots of instruments. And uh, Billy Troiani is in the Billy T band still over in Oslo. And Richie Crane, and we went through several drummers. That's where the Tom Russell band came from. And we recorded our first couple records in Norway, thanks to a friend named Tom Shekles said that and another guy named Gunnar for putting up the money and believing in us. Still to this day, we have a good following over there. That's where that came from. What made you decide to eventually disband the, the band and kind of go alone as kind of, um, I guess, um, a solo musician working with other musicians and collaborating with other people? Um, why did that sort of happen? It's, it's very difficult if you want to travel around the world, unless you're the Rolling Stones or whoever, uh, to carry five, you know, you have to usually have a driver or a roadie to carry five or six people. Uh, and, you know, we like to stay in pretty decent hotels now and, and like to be a bit comfortable. And, you know, the food on the road, my, my wife is not only a psychologist, she knows a lot about holistic food, what we should be eating, how to survive the road. The road, I used to say, is the great equalizer. I mean, a lot of people, not to mention names, have not survived the road. I mean, bad beds in bad hotels, bad mm. food, late nights, 300 mile, eight hour drives, it can get to you. And uh, I'm sure Richard Thompson talks about that. But uh, Gradually, although I took a band, uh, I played the David Letterman show five times. People can see that on YouTube, but uh, he hired us to play near his ranch in Montana. And I took a band that had Fats and Gerf Morlicks and Rick Richards in it and Michael Martin. But generally speaking, it began to look like I would just rather play with a backup guitarist. And uh, after Andrew, there was uh, Michael Martin from Texas, and, and, and he ended up not liking the road that much. Great guitarist. And then uh, uh, Thad Beckman from Portland, great guitar player. And then uh, my last one from Milan, Italy, Max De Bernardi, who I'm taking guitar lessons from via internet now. Um, gradually uh, learned a lot from Max, but I realized that I was becoming most comfortable, and a lot of people agree with this, solo, telling mm -hmm. stories, learning new guitar licks, being able to uh, walk around, do whatever I want, do the opening act, and just develop this solo style. As Bob Dylan said, uh, a quote, I'll misquote, but uh, I've seen a, a lone man with a guitar can bring down an entire army. And if the song is strong enough, and your singing and your sincerity and passion are song enough, and you got some licks, and uh, I think you can build a great solo career. I've seen, I've worked with people like Jesse Winchester who could just blow you away solo, and Steve Young, but they came out of an electric background, but solo, and Dylan too, in a way. I've seen Dylan solo a couple times when I was a kid, and the power was in the passion and the song and the delivery. As a songwriter, you go through this process of, you know, you come up with an idea or a theme, you, you write the song and you, you obviously work out the, the instrumentation, the key, how you want it to sound. And then all of a sudden an artist might come along and decide they want to take your creation and do their kind of interpretation or, or take of it. As a writer, how do you kind of feel about that? Is it something that you think, oh, this is tremendous, this famous artist or this big band have decided to take my song and record it? Or do you sometimes think, oh, I, I wish they'd have not done that because they kind of didn't get the point of the song? 
No, two, two answers to that question. The, the only thing I, I don't like is if people change the words. I, I think that's unlawful. Mm. A few people have used my song, Who's Gonna Build Your Wall, which was written, I don't know, seven or eight or nine years, 10 years ago, and changed the words to make it fit whatever political stance they wanted. And it wasn't written that way. But in general, 99% of the time, I enjoy and I'm honored if anybody cuts the song. If one of my favorite songs I've written is Guadalupe, it's been cut dozens of times, and Blue Wing. And if Dave Alvin takes it or a guy in Scotland takes, Dave did Blue Wing, but a guy in Scotland did Guadalupe out on a beach somewhere very sincere version or somebody at an open mic session or a hoot nanny. So I'm very honored if anybody covers my song, as long as the lyrics, the story stays the same. I, I can imagine you're honored. I mean, it's such an incredible list and it goes on, you know, page after page. I could be here for like literally a long time. Johnny Cash, you know, one of the great icons of country music. You've got Katie Lang, who's a fantastic vocalist. Guy Clark, Joe Ely, who I'm a big fan of, Nancy Griffiths. It's just, it's an incredible list of names. Right. Uh, it must be, you know, like you say, it must be a great honor, those fantastic artists taking your songs and almost opening them up to different audiences as well. Incredible, and that was very well put, yeah. Different audience, uh, you know, always when, there's audiences all over the world, Australia, UK, Norway, United States. Uh, but to have a Johnny Cash, and the quick story was uh, when I first met him, it was here in Switzerland at the Zug Festival. That's a, a city over here. And we had breakfast together. He told me how much he loved Veterans Day, which he cut and blew wing. I don't know if that's ever surfaced, but uh, that night at the festival, he called me out of the audience, 10,000 people, and, uh, and uh, oh, I had a Robert Hunter <laughs> uh, anecdote. I didn't say that Robert sang Gallo del Cielo in front of 10,000 people at a UK festival, one of the big ones. He said, this is a Tom Russell song, another great thing that Robert did. But Johnny called me up, and he said, do the same piece in the valley with me, that his encore, and I said, I don't know it. And he sang the last <laughs> verse into my ear and it came out of my mouth, sounding like I was a Johnny Cash ventriloquist dummy, and which was great, uh, my encounters with him. And uh, last time I saw him a couple weeks later, he signed a picture to my friend, Tom, and he okay. yelled back at me, keep writing those songs, Tom. So that, that meant a lot. Uh, Nancy Griffith, I toured with, several times in the UK when she was filling the Royal Albert Hall and uh, doing a bunch of my songs, Canadian Whiskey, St. Olaf's Gate, uh, Ramblin' Jack Elliott did a few of my songs, uh, Katie Lang, that was a live cut on a festival of Honky Tonk Heart I wrote with, uh, with Carl Browse and uh, oh yeah, I could go on and on. It, a, a tremendous honor that they spread this out to their audience and in respected the song enough to do it. The thing that strikes me the most chatting to you today, uh, which has probably interested me the most is this storytelling that, you know, you are a storyteller, um, painting a, you know, a story, a narrative, but you're particularly interested in, you mentioned the American Southwest, blue collar American life, as you mentioned, and events in your own life why why are those things kind of interested you the most? What is it about those kind of things that you've kind of encountered, people you've met? Why why did that fascinate you the most as a, a songwriter? I think first of all, and I'm not reading the answer, but I, I think you mentioned the Southwest, right? And then blue blue collar, good job. Yeah. Well, the Southwest, I had to get out of New York in 1997 or so. I'd had enough of the East Coast. I was always drawn to the desert and still am. Uh, the uh, 
the uh, the sunsets, the agaves, the cactus, the mezcal, the tequila, uh, the uh, just and the history down there on the border. So uh, I wanted to live there and, and found this 1930s adobe and lots of history just in the walls. There was even a ghost in the house. I wasn't a big believer in ghosts, but I became one. There's a little gal that uh, had died in a train wreck that used to live in the house, and so, but she was a nice ghost. Lots of stories there, small engine repair, real people. And uh, people working for me that would clean the yard and stuff always had stories, and Mexican songs. So I was getting a lot of flavor there. And uh, the blue collar thing was, uh, I'd had uh, five or six blue collar jobs over the years. The ones up in Vancouver, chipping ice out of railroad switches, working on the roofs of houses, you know, with, temporarily and uh, in LA, when I was trying to make enough money to go to college, uh, I worked in a creamery, challenge creamery, just unloading boxes off of box cars, boxes of uh, cheese and butter and stuff, butter stripper. You would strip these huge cubes of butter out of boxes and then they would cut them up into butter. And uh, then I was a weed abatement guy. I, during the Watts riots, I was out near there uh, cleaning off vacant lots. I got a lot out of the people I worked with, the way they talked, their lives. And uh, to end it, and of course, growing up with Bakersfield music and country music in the 50s, a lot of it was centered on blue collar themes, you know. And uh, when I ended up writing U.S. Steel, it was a story I heard from a one armed guy at a gas station in Pittsburgh about the steel factories closing and the bars they hung out. So I always had my ear open for that stuff I might have used if I was a novelist, you know, or I was Steinbeck said. But uh, so this this next record, I mean, when people my one of my sisters once asked me, you don't own a TV. I said, no, I don't own a TV. Uh, I don't like the commercials. I don't, you know. She goes, well, where do you get your news? And I thought like, well, from people, those people I worked with. And a year or so ago, we drove into a Walmart in Texas. I don't know what I was buying them. Some paint supplies or something. And there was an old, older woman at the counter trying, struggling with the computer to check me out. She looked to be in her 80s and her name was Nancy. And I wondered, how did she end up here and I said we got to talk and she said she was from Chicago she was a registered nurse and she had a profound education but she had to go back to work in her 80s and uh, we spoke about that and everything she said just rang in my ears so I thought there is the news right there there is somebody working in the middle of America that has a story so although 100% of my songs aren't about those people, some of them are because the language rings true and the story rings true. I can ask you the, the obvious question that you probably get asked time and time again. Every interviewer probably dips into this one. As creative people, we're always in, inspired and influenced by individuals. And you mentioned so much about people's stories and so on. But other songwriters, who are the ones that really kind of got you into music and when you heard their music you you kind of thought they really set the bar up that that high and their songwriting is you know immense who for you you know were those people well the two very obvious ones of course bob dylan mm. now dylan uh i first heard him in 62 or something not his first record his second record um where he had Don't Think Twice on and Blowing in the Wind, but uh, the way he moved forward in the next three or four years till he hit Highway 61 and Blowing on Blowing, it was stunning. Stunning. I thought, there's the best job in the world, but nobody can equal it. And nobody ever has, really. Uh, as he moved forward through protest music and then this Artaud type poetic stuff and uh, like a Rolling Stone. So Dylan was a main inspiration, but not so much an influence because uh, nobody can really do that. 
it's like wanting to be a, a wire walker in the circus, you know, like you can't get up there. But the other main one that's related to Dylan is Ian Tyson, the great Canadian singer who was in the group Ian and Sylvia. They had about 10 records out, pretty big in the 60s. Then Ian went on in the 70s after they broke up to reinvent cowboy music. And we both wrote, I ended up writing songs with both Ian and Sylvia uh, after they broke up. Ian was one of the first people to record my song, Gallo del Cielo, um, before we even met, I mean, in the 80s. And then we wrote Navajo Rug, which was a pretty a hit song for him. But he was, I would say, my biggest influence. And when you co-write with a guy like that, and he has, he was very literate, although he's a cowboy, but he's very well educated, very well read. He's still up there in the outside of Calgary on his on his uh, horse ranch. I wrote a song called uh, on the folk hotel record about him, like I'll never leave these old horses. Learned a tremendous amount from Ian Tyson to this day about he had a knowledge. Ian and Sylvia had a great knowledge of old folk songs that they a lot of which they cut on their first couple records. And uh, he could draw from that. Uh, the one of the last songs we wrote called Ross Knox five or six, seven years ago, sort of was based on a theme of an old ballad called Lord, Lord Lovell. And he would quote it to me. I'd never even heard of it. So I learned a lot from Tyson and, uh, and there were another, a bunch of other writers, you know, Jesse Winchester, great writer of setting the landscape. These Southern writers like Steve Young and Jesse Winchester, uh, you know, Mississippi, you're on my mind, Jesse Winchester, Steve Young, Seven Bridges Road. They would take you right to the landscape and then tell kind of a personal story. And uh, they've influenced me. I could probably uh, mention dozens and dozens of writers, you know, so that was, that, those are some of them. I'm going to ask you one final question before we come on to our quick fi final questions at the end. Um, obviously, I, I suppose, term the expression, the arts, it goes through all kinds of changes as, as times move forward, technology changes. We're seeing that tremendously at the moment with the, the film industry changing a lot with cinemas being closed and online streaming. But the music business kind of went through this massive revolution that you've seen and you've been part of with streaming, the internet, of course, um, maybe artists finding it harder to make money through selling albums. What changes have you embraced and which changes have you not been so keen on over the years with the, the change? Oh, God. Well, some things are funny. I mean, LPs came back and they're still kind of back for vinyl fanatics. I think yeah, that's vinyl. Cool. Yeah, indeed. Vinyl came back. Uh, in fact, I just did a record company for a uh, cover for somebody in Norway, but uh, the last record came out on vinyl. As far as streaming, social media, that's it could go either way. You know, social media is full of a lot of opinions and blah, blah, blah. But streaming and, and uh, there's about 10 and YouTube, etc. They can be a good thing if your music is honest and getting out to the public, you know. For instance, I was on the David Letterman show doing five songs over the years uh, and uh, with that huge orchestra. And, and uh, you can see that now on YouTube. And, uh, you know, I've done some online festivals and uh, this and that. Nothing's like being on stage, but there there is an advantage to it. I mean, they pay small royalties and it's a way of keeping your songs out there uh, as long as you don't overdo it. Uh, so I think, you know, it's 50-50. But uh, the other change is the, the great change in uh, country music over the last 30 years or so, 40 years. By the, uh, the 70s were a great time for what they call Americana music and outlaw music in Texas. It took off when Willie Nelson moved there from Nashville. And then you had Guy Clark and Towns Van Zandt and... Uh, Jerry Jeff Walker and people like that, creating a kind of raw edge 
personal uh, country rock or whatever they wanted to call it, outlaw music. Guy Clark was great. Again, I would put him in, in as an influence, like Jesse Winchester. Guy always created the landscape of West Texas mostly. But then country music in Nashville kind of in the 80s and 90s went sort of pop to reach a wider audience, I guess, and a different sound. And a lot of that, uh, not to put it down, I had a hit that I wrote with Nancy Griffith called Outbound Plane that Susie Boggus did. And that, that was a cool sounding record. A lot of the stuff didn't hit me that much. So I've seen changes, some of it good, some of it doesn't rub off on me. And I have to keep my nose to the grindstone and my passion centered on where I want to take it. And how much of this I can use without it being annoying. I'm going to come on to the final set of questions. So we ask all our guests these final 12 questions. They're just quick fire questions. Um, you don't need to think about them in any detail. But here's question number one. I do like this bit. What's your favorite pastime? Wow, hanging out with my wife, really. Um, God, I wrote down some answers, but I'm not going to look at them. No, I would like to see what my initial reaction was when you said that. A painting, Yep. hanging out with my wife and uh, having happy hour with my wife where we discuss things and, uh, you know, that's where we put the day behind us, you know, even the painting behind us and uh, chill out and enjoy our meal. You mentioned the Western. I love Westerns like yourself, but what's your favorite film and why? I would say Don't Look Back, the documentary that came out in the 60s on Dylan, because it's so honest. You know, he had a penny breaker, had the camera on him at all times at interviews and in hotel rooms late at night when there were almost punch outs and everybody's drunk and Donovan's there and it's it just it's very real uh also Monty Hellman's Tulane Blacktop that has uh uh James Taylor and Dennis Wilson and, and I ended up writing a soundtrack uh for Monty later on called uh uh The Road to Nowhere but those are some of them who's your favorite novelist Oh my God, I mentioned Graham Greene because I discovered Graham Greene when I was living in Nigeria, he bad Nigeria, box of books we found in a library. And there's about three Graham Greene novels that really hit me. The Heart of the Matter, which takes place in West Africa where he worked, Graham, Graham's buried right down the road here in Switzerland. Uh, and uh, several of his novels, as well as Charles Portis who wrote Through Grit, but he also wrote two out outsider novels called Gringos and Dog of the South about gringos living in Mexico. Those are really well-written novels. If you could have had a, a different profession, what would you have done? I don't think that would be possible. I've ended up where I'm supposed to be. I, I was meant to be a songwriter. I can't get songs out of my head, whether it's a a song I'm writing or an old Ian and Sylvia song, I have to wake up in the morning and say, I got to brush my teeth and hear a little beggar man again. I got, so I'm, I'm always focused on songwriting. Uh, maybe I would have been a novelist, but I don't think any kind of a straight job. Tough question. This one, I can answer this because I've got too many inspirations, but who's been your greatest inspiration in life? Uh, my wife, Nadine, I mean, she's, she sort of semi manages my career, her career, as I say, she's a psychologist, she teaches yoga, which is helpful on the road to loosen up. Uh, she watches what we eat. She, she loves music. She loves Texas music. As I said, she knew Doug Somm and she knows Augie Meyer. She loves Bill Kirchin. She keeps us going. So, I mean, I could mention Dylan, but she's my greatest inspiration. Do you read a, a newspaper? And if so, which one? None. <laughs> Same here. Um, what's your favorite food? Paella. Oh, I'm yeah. uh, Lovely. I lived in Spain a couple months after Nigeria, and I became a fan. You could smell it coming up the street every day on those open fires, the huge paella pen with the 
the rice, the arroz, the Spanish rice, and uh, and uh, it could be a seafood pie or a chicken pie. And years later, uh, living in El Paso, I taught myself slowly. I'm still learning to make pie, and I put on some uh, flamenco music. I get in the mood. Later on, we might have a glass of sangria. Takes about three hours, but uh, I'm working on a paella as my inspiration. You mentioned your wife as your greatest inspiration, Nadine, but who is your favorite cultural icon? I don't quite know what that means. Uh, again, I would icon. Again, I would say Bob Dylan. If he's yeah. iconic, I don't know. Yeah. What's your favorite curse word and why? Horse shit, maybe. <laughs> Bullshit or horseshit, and uh, anything because we hear we hear so much of <laughs> your favorite favorite place or holiday destination. We or... don't literally do holidays, but we occasionally, on the way, like if we're going from here to Texas, we love uh, Montauk, which is the end of Long Island. It's it's out there in the middle of the ocean. It's it's a great beach, great hotels, great food, and. Uh, I used to go there years ago. The first American cattle ranch was on Montauk and Montauk Indians were out there. Teddy Roosevelt used to hunt out there. So I would say uh, Montauk. We'll skip favorite music artists because you've mentioned so many and you've uh, spoken about Bob Dylan in, in great detail, but what is your favorite album? Uh, Highway 61, revisited by Dylan. I mean, I'm still figuring out Desolation Row. And it uh, sounds like an Alice in Wonderland trip when the doorknob broke. But he, he hits it, the nail on the head. And just like Tom Thumb's blues about a wild night in Juarez, which I'm sure he took uh, with New Earth and some of the people I know. And uh, I cut that with Joe Ely on the Folk Hotel record. So I would say that record. Tom Russell, thank you kindly for joining me today on Your Take. Uh, for me, it's been a, a fascinating conversation on your life, your songwriting, the stories behind those songs and uh, your career. Um, before we finish up, can you just let the listeners and the watchers know where they can find out more about Tom Russell music and your other creative works? FronteraRecords.com um, has a lot of my stuff, my books, my records, some of my art. Uh, all of my art all over the world is on TomRussellArt.com. We have Facebook, we have Instagram. Uh, TomRussell.com has the upcoming uh, gigs in the fall uh, all over the world, Texas and all over the world. They can it, well, mostly it's in the U.S. in the fall, but uh, they can go on TomRussell.com and see links to all this stuff. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your time today. Thank you, James.